Thanks, Alex. And thanks, everyone, for coming late in the afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, what I'm going to be talking about is more on processes on how we can define regional organization in the mammalian brain. Why organization? Well, uh, I mean, in all the analysis that we're doing, it's, it's in the crux of multiple species and modalities, the understanding of how the brain is organized into distinct regions. And this goes back to when Broadman created these areas, <coughs> showing that you can partition the brain into these discrete isolated regions, and these regions would carry on some very spe specialized uh, identity to support our function and behavior. So over the last century, we've been trying to find ways to optimize how we can define these areas in the brain. And most of, and the typical way of doing this is by using histology. Uh, and there's been a lot of fantastic work over the last couple of days on how we can properly use histology to define these area, aerial boundaries. So the typical way is to use cytoarchitecture or myelo-architecture or chemoarchitecture. But obviously, you know, 20 years ago, this, these things are not available in human in a high resolution sense. So we rely specifically on the use of multiple, uh, of using uh, brain imaging. And there's been a lot of success uh, in creating definitions of these areas, which we call parcellations, using different features such as cortical folding, salsa and gyri, functional connectivity and structural connectivity. But I don't know about you, but every time I write a paper and then you create and choose your parcellation, a reviewer will always ask, have you tried it with another parcellation? And the main reason for this is because these parcellations don't align well, right? Their boundaries do not fit perfectly because there are intrinsic assumptions when these parcellations were created. We don't know the features that is most transferable to explain a lot of the properties and an identity of or organization of the brain. And we always rely on these really, really sharp transitions in such, for example, cell type. And we also create uh, methodologies that will produce these uh, aerial boundaries on a single resolution level. But importantly, we always have to go back in trying to find universal principles of organization that you can use to understand different species and also individuals. So the problem with using you know, high resolution techniques that we have in imaging is that certain animals won't have them. Right? Uh, so it's difficult to create comparative parcellations across animals without these important complex data sets. And finally, when we try and use data to create these aerial boundaries, we rely upon on what the data is showing, but it lacks an, an understanding on why the data is actually showing you those boundaries in the first place. So that's kind of what we're trying to focus in this work. And one way to, to under, kind of make, kind of give you insights to how these aerial boundaries are formed is you, if you go back to what developmental biology has told us. So if, if you look at, say, different animals, uh, say in the mouse brain, as shown in this picture, there are these things called morphogens. So morphogens are genetic materials which carry and propagate through the brain and create these gradients that will kind of trigger changes in cells to form kind of their cell fate. Now, why is this important uh, to brain organization? So um, if you have your prototypical, say, formation of S1, M1, and A1 in a wild-type mice, People have directly uh, kind of changed the profiles of these morphogens and tried to look if the organization changes. So if you develop knockout mice where you change, say, the concentration of EMX2 in a certain direction, you'd see here that the uh, S1 will kind of slightly shift downwards and kind of expand it, and V1 will become very, very small. So there really is this interplay between changes in this uh, morphogenetic regulation in, and the resulting um, overall organization as you develop. 
And more importantly, the, in, the interesting thing is most of these morphogenetic gradients follow really, really simple axes. And this is, this is true for different types of animal and even in worms or, or flies. And most of them follow this really prototypical rostrocodal, dorsal ventral, or medial lateral axis. So is there a way to find kind of proxies on defining these axis of variation? And is there a feature that is universally present across these species that we can kind of use to approximate this fundamental axis? And yes, we do. And that is kind of the geometric profile of your brain. So in our, the, in our previous work, we've shown that just by using brain geometry, you can calculate what we call as the eigenmodes. And the first three non-constant ones here will follow those prototypical fundamental axes. And we've shown that the power of geometry can be shown in how it can constrain a lot of brain dynamics in both rest and task and the emerging function. So we ask here is if we can use geometry to define or find some kind of universal principle on how aerialization happens in the first place. And ultimately, that's what we want, right? Uh, evolution should follow some kind of uniform rule to define overall brain organization. So that's what we do and use the concept of the argument modes just by using the geometry. So we start by using T1-weighted MRI, and you can extract this cortical surface, for example, using FreeSurfer in humans. Uh, or you can do this three-dimensionally, uh, volumetrically, by taking a mask of a certain nuclei or some kind of ROI of interest. And then you basically just use that cortical surface mesh, and you can calculate these uh, geometric eigenmodes. Here, I'm showing you the first non-constant one, which varies along the rostrocortal axis. And you can kind of use the nodal lines as an approximation of this boundary between two partitions. And you can repeat the process hierarchically uh, by dividing regions that you have already divided previously. And you can carry on as many times as you want. So basically, what you will get is a division of the entire brain into two, which will be divided into two, into two, into two. So you'll get powers of two. But you can also use the eigenvalues because they dictate the dominance of that uh, rostrocortal uh, geometric eigenmode to provide a natural ordering. That's why the tree is kind of asymmetric in this case, where x axis is the eigenvalue of that partition. And you can certainly create a multi scale parcellation in according to your favorite number. It could be 319. Uh, so the question is, is this hierarchical kind of process biologically possible? You can look at the literature in the brain, and maybe it's impossible to find. But you can kind of carry on information on what biology is telling us. And this hierarchical process is existing, not just in the brain, but in multiple types of organs in limb formation, digit formation, or organ formation. So, I mean, biology loves using the same rules. So there is some possibility that this hierarchical process may be beneficial in also partitioning or defining brain organization. So again, um, we use the cortical surface if you want to study, uh, uh, if you want to create surface-based uh, parcellations. And you can create this multi-scale Oscillations, and you can choose the appropriate scale according to some question of your interest. Now, the question is how you validate this approach. And the problem is, again, we don't have um, uh, ground truth. So we do what we do is to compare it with existing oscillations and kind of uh, uh, measure how good it can capture different biological properties in the brain. So. Say we start with this uh, existing Brodmann parcellation, and we create a geometric parcellation with equal number, so you have a fair comparison. And we uh, tried to extract as many of these parcellations as possible, but we tried to be a little bit selective and make sure that we kind of sample 
the different postulations based on different techniques, such as histological based, anatomical based, hybrid methodologies, or even just functionally, functional connectivity based uh, derived uh, postulations. And most of the most of the time, when people create new postulations, the only way to validate it is, is to calculate how homogeneous those regions are. Because the assumption is, if the boundary is most likely true, if the points inside those boundaries will have similar profiles, that's what homogeneity is. But most of the time, we rely on single unimodal feature, such as functional connectivity. In here, what we want to do is to simultaneously compare the postulations across diverse uh, kind of biological properties. In here, we compare in human about 245 of those. So <coughs> we, what we want to do is to compare the homogeneity of geometric parcellations with existing ones. And he, this is what I'm showing in this plot. So in the uh, y-axis is the parcellation, and the x-axis is the different maps that we're trying to compare. And red means that the geometric parcellation is producing more homogeneous regions than the existing ones. And you can see that, again, using T1 weighted and just based on geometry, it's kind of doing well. And if you look across the different maps, you see that, again, it doesn't win all the time. But again, it's using one feature to capture all these biological properties at once. So and the interesting thing is because this, the approach is simple, it is actually very generalizable. So I've shown you the way to do it on the human cortex, which is surface-based, but you can do this in volume-based and other animals as well. And that's what we have done. So you can do this in macaques and marmosets, and you can also do this in subcortical nuclei, so you kind of get, get uh, your nuclei of interest. And you can also do this in the mouse acid cortex if you want to. And what we have found, if you, if you do the same experiment of comparing the geometric parcellations with the existing ones in terms of homogeneity across diverse maps, we find that indeed the geometric parcellations really, really do well even across these different species. Again, it's a one-step, one-stop approach, right? And we went a little bit further and asked if we can extend the approach to create parcellations in animals that don't have existing ones. And we can, and that's what we have done, thanks to the data provided by Schwartz et al. in 2023. And we have done that, that across diverse mammalian species. And for us, this is kind of cool because it provides a really good first uh, parcellation for species without multimodal data that you rec need to create really sophisticated uh, parcellation schemes. And lastly, is I will go back to the mechanism, because obviously at the, I started the talk in asking in how do we describe processes, or how do we find processes that will describe how these areas develop in the first place. So we go back to that morphogenetic analogy that I uh, kind of um, glossed over a while ago. And what we have done in here is to kind of mimic this uh, uh, morphogenetic mechanism. So what we do is to kind of create the, you know, place multiple morphogens in different regions and kind of run a reaction diffusion model process that will, so the, the morphogens will diffuse along the cortical surface and you can kind of track how the concentrations of those molecules compare with each other. So what we found is that if you follow the first, uh, if you just run the first process, the steady state solution of that reaction diffusion process, the one showing, uh, I'm showing above, and the initial parcellation you get by splitting the brain to two, the one below, almost perfectly matches what the geometric parcellations are giving you. So, and this is true, actually, regardless of where you put the, the, the morphogens. Uh, and um, this is kind of a validation that the geometric parcellation can mimic that reaction diffusion mechanism. And the assumption here is that well, as soon as you get that steady state solution, it will trigger the next uh, kind of reaction diffusion of another type of, of, of molecule. So in summary, I've shown you a, for me, 
and bias, a cool multi-scale geometric approach for brain parcelation that's only derived from T1 weighted imaging, which a lot of species have. So it's highly generalizable, even across different structures. It produces very, very homogeneous regions as assessed simultaneously across diverse brain properties, suggesting that this geometric feature is highly transferable. And we have found ways that, to show that it can be linked to some biologically plausible mechanism. So, and finally, suggesting that geometry really plays a fundamental role, not just in shaping a function, but also regional organization. But we also have to emphasize that we're trying to find a process to define area, you know, how areas develop, but we're not claiming that the parcellations that we're getting are the best that you can find, but trying to ask if geometry alone can provide this fundamental constraint uh, to better understand uh, brain, brain, brain organization beyond just database uh, description. So thanks to the uh, incredible people behind this work. And another plug from Ashley, uh, if you're interested more in evolution and development, there's a, another conference two months from now in beautiful Croatia. And they've extended the, uh, deadlo the deadline just for OHPM. So thank you.